Welcome to Flow. Are we excited? Did you have a, did you have a good lunch? Yes. Are we like caffeinated up and ready to go? So I've been on Workplace um, back when, since we used to dream about conferences like this, and we used to dream about billboards on the 101. Um, this panel is going to be all about growing and scaling, and I will tell you that we certainly have um, gotten some things right, and we have also made our fair share of mistakes. As uh, you might know, only one in 100 companies makes it to unicorn status. Uh, so it is not an easy thing to do. And we have some great leaders um, from tech joining us here today. And we're going to talk about how do you get to that billion dollar unicorn status and scale your company. So without further ado, uh, Jason Lemkin from Saster, Melissa Taunton from NEA, Mark Mater from Spreadsheet, Smartsheet, sorry, and Eric Yuan from Zoom. Welcome. Anyone wants to move up, move up. We'll keep this uh, intimate. So just to kick things off, would love to just start off with a short introduction, um, who you are, your company. And maybe you could leave us with also one word, one word of what do you think it takes to get to billion dollar unicorn status? Uh, Eric, let's start with you on that end. Sure. And uh, yeah, I'm a founder of CEO of Zoom. And uh, how many of you are using Zoom? Zoom costume. Oh, thank you. I came to the right place. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. What's your question? <laughs> That's all you. I always think about a Zoom. I think by you the know way, what you do. I, I like your billboard. Yeah. By this morning, I want to drive by one way many times. I like your, you know, Facebook billboard right with Zoom there. So, yeah. so good. We're billboard buddies. Okay. What one word? What does it take? It's hard to use one word, I would say. Hard work. Yeah. Mark. Do I get two words, too? Yeah, that's two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Mark Mater, CEO of Smartsheet. We are a SaaS company based out of Seattle, uh, serving customers in 190 countries today, helping business users graduate from having stored and managed a lot of work in spreadsheets to a place where they can better track, organize, automate, and report out on their work in a way that's not too intimidating for them and really resonating with that business class user. Uh, we do support IT as well, but that's really not who we're solving for principally. Uh, my one word would be conviction. That's a good one. I'm Melissa Taunton. I'm a partner at New Enterprise Associates, and we're probably still the largest venture firm, but probably not for much longer with the funds that are being raised right now. So we have about 20 billion under management, and uh, people always ask me, what do I invest in? And I invest in people, and really looking for next-gen thinkers and leaders and founders who are uh, self-aware enough to really develop the skills needed to scale and, and grow these companies into unicorns. And uh, with that, I think my one word would be leadership because without really um, skilled leadership and dedicated leadership, uh, these companies uh, won't get to where they need to go. Uh, for sure. Uh, I'm Jason Lemkin. Uh, I founded a couple companies that were not uh, as remotely successful as my colleagues, but had a little bit of success. And, Sold my last company called EchoSign to Adobe, which is now the center of Adobe Document Cloud. And um, I sold just when it got good. Uh, we were sort of, I think, of the generation when Smartsheet got started. Um, and uh, I didn't know. I didn't have great mentors. I didn't have great people helping me. And I didn't realize that just about when you get to a million a month, if you can grow more than 100% a year and you have happy customers, you literally can't be stopped. So uh, I did make a few nickels. It wasn't the end of the world. I was fairly compensated, but it was I had I had to like kind of share my my learnings, and I started writing a little blog, uh, and like people started to read it. Like the first like I got was Aaron Levy, who was earlier. So I realized if guys like Aaron like this cathartic content, other people might. So today we're the largest community in the world. It's called Saster for. B2B executives, uh, Mark's been on our podcast, Eric's spoken in our events, I've been on our podcast, and we'll have about 12,000 people at our event in February, um, and it's all about kind of 
learning to scale uh, and the journey. Uh, and I think what I've learned, you know, I, I built a business that became a nine-figure business, but I didn't run it all the way there, and I've now invested in two companies that became unicorns in four years uh, from seed. And uh, I think the real learning, my learning is just commitment. Uh, it just, it never gets easier, does it? Eric, is it any easier today? No, it's harder. Mark, is it any easier this year than it was last year? Not so much. It, it's not. It actually never, it never gets easier. But if you're committed, if you commit for seven to ten years in the beginning, and then you commit for 30 years when you're at the smart sheet and Zoom level, if you really commit for real for 30 years, uh, your software doesn't get old and stodgy. You just pull away because look at these SaaS companies. There are so many that are approaching a billion a year, not just Salesforce, but the HubSpots, the Zendesks, and yeah. everyone's giving guidance on when they'll hit a billion because this recurring revenue turned out to recur. Like we, we used to talk about recurring revenue, but I don't think any of us really believed it in our hearts that literally we didn't have that experience. I mean, WebEx started off as minutes, right? You didn't know if it would recur, but we learned that, that, that this recurring revenue thing is like hyper powerful. It's amazing. It just keeps going. Yeah. If you, if you nurture it, you have to water it and nurture it and innovate. But if you do right by your customers, they, they do renew, right? Mm -hmm. So as you know, the theme of our conference is flow. And flow is all about how do you remove those distractions to allow people to really do their best work. Uh, there's several pillars to flow. One of them is purpose. I know our purpose for workplace, we grew out of an environment here at Facebook where we believe openness and transparency makes really good things happen in organizations. So I'm curious, um, Eric and Mark, how did you think about defining the purpose of your organizations? And has it changed? Yeah, I think in the early years, it was it was uh, just assumed. We, we kind of knew what it was, and we didn't have to articulate it. Uh, and when we were a team, even 80, 100 people, we still had that feeling of we just knew what to do, how to feel, how to act, how to communicate. Um, and then as you hit those markers of 250 people, 500 people, we, we had spent some time defining these mission statements and purpose statements. It wasn't until we almost reached 1,000 people that we actually invested in articulating that purpose statement. And I would say a good measure for whether you believe in your purpose statement or not is whether your purpose statement has to be followed by two other sentences that, ex that, that explain why your purpose statement isn't so cheesy after all. Uh, so so it's, um, we try to choose very simple words, uh, empowering everyone to improve how they work. And each one of those words has meaning. And the team, whether you're developing, marketing, selling, you understand what that means to you. Uh, and much like I think the speaker earlier today said, you hammer this thing over and over and over. The customer stories you tell, we refer to our purpose statement. And, uh, and that's sort of a not optional thing at our company. And uh, we're, none of us are embarrassed about it. We celebrate it. Uh, I think one of the most corny mantras, we don't refer to it as such, but it's, it is one of those things that, that is repeated over and over and over. Yep. Yes. Uh, our purpose is, uh, is to deliver happiness to our customers, and uh, we have that purpose on day one, and even today, it remains the same. It boils down to my personal story, because uh, you know, I built a WebEx before as one of the first several founding engineers, and uh, later on, you know, we sold it to Cisco in 2007. I was there for another four and a half years. I, I was working, working very, very hard trying to make WebEx better, but guess what, in the 13 years of 14 years of hard work, every time, you know, back to 2010, 2011 time frame, every time when I visited a web as a customer, I did not see a single happy customer. So every day I was so embarrassed. And uh, that's why I see I, I, I needed to fix this problem. I really want to make sure how to bring happiness to our customers. You know, like, uh, you know, happened to be this month, uh, so this week, we are going to have our user conference. We are welcome all of you to join as well. And that's our purpose, to make sure customers are happy. Sorry, I have to touch on that one for a second. How do you know when your customers are happy? Oh, you would do so many things. Like, you know, we have an NPS score measurement. Every day, look at my calendar. Always three or four meetings with the customer. Always talk with the customer. All of our employees always talk with customer. We never have some email or negative comments. We always try to understand why is that, try to fix that problem. And uh, you know, every day if customer always send you very positive feedback, they, they will tell you, I like your service. You wear the Zoom t-shirt in the airport, they give you a big hug, you know they like you, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, seriously, you try to wear a t-shirt, you know, talk with someone. If this, oh, they don't want to talk with you, 
you knew something wrong. So. <laughs> Melissa, what have you seen work or not work as companies think about their purpose? Well, I think it's really important uh, as you scale, and you were talking about this, you get to 100 people, you get to 250, and you all pretty much know who each other are and, and speak the same language, and you develop a language, uh, and then you start scaling, and it starts happening rapidly, and it's very easy to bring in large amounts of people who don't speak the language. And so really articulating constantly, as you've done, it's the drumbeat of your company, um, what is the what? What are we solving for? What, what is going to drive um, customer acquisition? What's your CAC? Um, and having everyone speak a common language. And really, as you bring you know, swaths of new people, and I can't emphasize enough the onboarding uh, program of really even giving them a list of acronyms, a list of common traits within the company, so that everyone is bought into the what. And then they can all get behind the how uh, and how to scale that what. But if um, people are not speaking the same language or as a CEO, your communication is not reaching the outer limits of your organization, you're gonna lose that purpose on the fringe. Um, and I think really starting to hone your skills as a leader to communicate one to one and then one to 10 and using your executive leadership team and your management team as the artery of your organization. And knowing that those, uh, that management team is truly representing um, your what to everyone on, on the perimeter as well. I'm just curious, Jason and Melissa, you guys see a lot of companies. Have you ever seen a situation where purpose was done badly? Uh, let me, I, I, I was just thinking through, uh, I, I don't know, for, for sure, let me step back. When I think about, I've worked with a lot of founders over the last, when I've been investing too for the last five years, almost all international, almost all just came to the U.S., almost all very early seed uh, from uh, Intercom to TalkDesk to Algolia, some I was large investor in, some were small. And when I look back at the ones that are successful, they many have been extremely successful. Interesting, they all have some variant of an uh, Eric-like story. I'm sure Smartsheet does, which is that when I first met them at 8K a month in revenue, 10K, they had this vision, um, and I don't know if it's purpose, but it's vision that's the same one. It's the same one today, and uh, maybe the second decade it has to change, right? I, I don't, I'm pretty sure Smartsheet isn't the same product today it was back back with the first 100 yeah. customers. So maybe, maybe that, that vision, but I, what I'm thinking through in real time, I'm shocked with the consistency of vision. And when I think about the handful of startups I've worked with that, that didn't get to the level, uh, they didn't have that consistency of vision. Maybe they had a great hack or a great initial idea, but the vision was, the, that vision was lacking. And, I, and um, so I don't know what's, what, what's actionable other than that clarity of vision maybe can carry you through a lot of tough times, right? Pe it, it, people know which companies to join and which not. If, if there are a lot of folks that I will tell you do not want to work in an environment where customer happiness is like all the CEO talks about every day. Some people just want to go home. They don't want to fix the bugs, right? This is hard. It's not fun. And maybe it's a rallying point if you can reinforce it. Um, but uh, that's helpful. Well, I also think your product vision might change, but what you're solving for and is doesn't change, um, making life easier for people to collaborate or whatever it may be. That mission may not change, but the products you build around it may drastically innovate. Um, I think, uh, you were saying where I think purpose has gone wrong, and I'm certainly not going to name any companies, but I think there are some companies who get so focused on hyper growth, um, and you've all read about them in the media, that they break a lot of glass, they hire people who are just like themselves, they, so they don't bake diversity into the organization, and because they all think they're playing for the same end goal, um, they should all look the same, think the same, and I think that's when you start to th see things break apart at scale. I think when purpose also merges with a destination, it's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. So we went public April 27th this year, and it was really important that that IPO didn't signify an end. Uh, so it's this, if you, don't, if you don't like continuous improvement and understanding that this thing goes on forever, you probably shouldn't work for our company. Uh, so because those milestones come and go real quickly, the first million dollar month, right, hundred million dollar marker, 
50,000th customer. It's like those actually show up. And then? So you have to have something which has a little bit of an open-ended back to it also. Yeah. Did you to do me, it? the one that, sorry, okay. uh, that I'm curious for you, because I'm struggling with this. We're in the 10th year of a bull run, right? Something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I feel like the mercenary cultures have exploded. Like the number of folks, and you can see it all over San Francisco. We were talking before about the advantages of San Jose hot San Francisco. Yep. But I think I hear it all over the world, right? I mean, you have places like Dublin, which has become like SDR central, like where everyone builds their SDR teams. And, and, and frictional unemployment's become zero, right? And you've become, it's not just mercenary culture in Soma, it's mercenary culture in, in Lisbon, in Dublin. And I guess it's a good thing, uh, but I struggle to think, how do you align purpose with folks who view 10 months as a, as a long commitment <laughs> to, to a job. Yeah, we don't see that in Seattle, Boston. Not in Seattle, ever, everyone's Edinburgh, pretty mellow. And all the cities in between, we just don't <laughs> see it. I think, I think that's what gets the headlines. There's yeah. so much that happens beneath the headlines. Uh, so there are thousands and thousands of people, hundreds of people in our organization who take a lot of pride having been there eight years. Hmm. And now we have to get some of that new blood in as well. Yeah. But boy, it's, I mean, that's one of the things coming down to the bay, that, uh, that mercenary culture is, it can be really damaging. There's a lot of goodness that comes out of it also. Yeah. It does. But uh, boy, we really try and celebrate those milestones. When we create moments for our employees about hitting a two-year mark, a five-year mark, a 10-year mark, and what we do for those employees, I mean, there's a lot of pride in those moments. And I think by raising those up, I think you can, you can deter some of that mercenary mindset. But it, it's real. I mean, not, <laughs> not challenging and it's not there, but I think there's a lot of other markers out there that, that are counterpoints. So another aspect of flow is, um, is culture. And as I mentioned at Workplace, we believe in an open and democratic culture. What do you think about that? Do you think an open and democratic culture is, is critical for success and for scale? I think, uh, yeah, in, in our case, uh, for sure, the open, transparent culture is really, really important. Otherwise, you know, you really cannot build a sustainable company. The business is really hard to build a trust. However, in terms of uh, democracy, I, I would say it's really hard to say because uh, mm -hmm. you know, for startups, speed is everything, right? Quite often, you know, you got to, as a CEO, you got to make a decision. You know, some, they may not understand that, just go full speed. But sometimes you also need to listen to your team member, to your customers, and uh, work together to make a decision. I think it's a hybrid. It cannot be the command and control, cannot be bottom up, and uh, need to be case by case, yeah. I agree 100%. I think I need, in this day and age, and, and hiring Gen Z and millennials, you, you don't have a choice but to be transparent and communicative and create an organization where they trust the leadership, but at the same time, you have to lead, and sometimes you have to make tough decisions. And I think, um, you know, the, the CEO and the leadership team has to make difficult choices sometimes, and sometimes it isn't a democracy, and that's really what leadership is about. But if you've built the trust and you've communicated as to the why, uh, I think you'll get the support of your people. I know, uh, Mark, when you and I spoke, uh, initially, you shared some stories around how you try to foster that direct connectedness between the CEO and the front line of your organization. And if it's okay, I'm going to share a letter that you shared with me. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you enable that to happen in your organization. How do you enable your front line and all of your employees to feel a flat organization? Yeah, so when we do new employee orientation, I, within the first couple minutes, I'll make a statement around values don't matter. Dramatic pause, standalone. And we focus a lot more about action. So I call values, we have values, we have coffee mugs with value, values on them, they're awesome, love drinking out of them. But absent mobilizing those, so ap we have this, this action framework, we call it, which is about observation, ideation, research, recommendation, and execution. So if you tell me a story about how you put things in motion, you'll, you'll capture me a lot more as opposed to saying, I'm really innovative, I'm really supportive, those are sort of hollow. And what we try to do is to uh, make people feel like observing and taking action with what they observed is a good thing. And, and while we talk about workplace, we have digitized and digitally transformed a bunch of our stuff internally. I think there's no substitute for the written word. And this is a story about a dev that I don't know that well, Brett, and this was a note he sent me after we changed our policy for parental leave. 
So I have two daughters, 15 and 18. I was probably home for a few days when each of them were born. So he wrote me this note uh, thanking me about the eight weeks he had with his fourth child, Caleb. And when you get this letter, the thing I love about the written word is you know that when he wrote that, the only thing he was thinking about was how he felt in that moment. It wasn't a copy-paste, wasn't a forward, he wrote it. And I think when you can establish a culture within which people can share like how they feel and giving you feedback on policy, this is about parental leave, but he's conveying also his, his connectedness to the organization, that encourages me to think about how to drive that next policy change. Because initially, I actually was not in favor of eight weeks parental leave for the dad. Mm -hmm. And I, I changed my position, and this has now served as a huge repeater for us. It's one small example of, I think, employees giving you feedback, and I think that's part of the reason why it workplaces around, too. How do, you, how do you get that observation and that feedback mechanism? How, Eric, how do you, at Zoom, how do you get employee feedback and drive that, that culture of openness? Wow. It's, uh a lot of things for sure we use Zoom, right? So, but anyway, so I think uh, we have a very open culture. So meaning I think from all levels, right? So, you know, um, we have IM every day. We don't want to employ it to wait until like annual review. We never have that. And here, you know, all the managers, myself, and all the door is open. Like we have all hands meeting. Before the all hands meeting, every employee, they can submit the questions anonymously, right? Any questions, feel free to share with us. We share all the questions with all, all the employees. We answer to those questions in the all hands meeting. And anything, you know, we always assume you know, all employees should know that. Unless you know, we have some funding we do not share too early. Otherwise, anything we share with all the employees. So essentially, if you trust the employee, employees give you feedback anytime. The small things, the big things, they send you emails, send you channel message, or the weekend they give you a call, they, they found something. I think that the trust is everything. If you have open, transparent culture, the employee, they, they will find all the ways to share with you. So. Yeah, I think the one thing you highlight there, Eric, that sparked for me is you used the word anonymous feedback. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a great fallacy around open door policy, where you can go to your new employee orientation, have open door policy. Well, the median employee is not going to walk into your office and give you that candid feedback. Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that you highlight the anonymous because about two-thirds of feedback that my CHRO and I receive is anonymous. Yeah. And some of it's, it, you're just dying for the person to give you the name so you can ask the follow-up question, but I'd still rather have that signal. Um, but that is, um, I think people, I think especially CEOs often fit, kid themselves and think, oh, I'm super open, everyone's going to come to me with everything. Not so much. Very true, very true. Right. Yeah. Melissa, you mentioned uh, Jen. You mentioned uh, Gen Z mm -hmm. earlier. So we all talk about millennials, but the reality is we're now, we now see Gen Z coming into the, the workplace. And these are individuals that were born in the mid-90s to the mid-2000s. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you all experiencing different behaviors, <laughs> mindsets? I mean, is it, a, yeah. is it about the free nutrition bars that are in the micro kitchens? Or yeah. how, what's going to be different with this generation? Well, I experience it every day because I have three teenagers in my house, so <laughs> uh, I could say a lot about Gen Z. But what I am seeing is, uh, you know, they've grown up with technology, and so um, they're very good at multitasking and are quite used to persistent interruption or change. Uh, they do get bored easily, and I think they are really looking at careers and education in a very different way. Um, if you think about, you know, I have three juniors, they're all gonna be applying to college. Um, really trying to imagine what you will be doing 10, 20, 30 years from now is pretty much impossible to do um, unless you have a very strong conviction around, you know, a, a, a vocation like medicine. But even that's gonna change uh, radically. So I think, um, in terms of workforce, you know, hiring Gen Z and retaining them and keeping them interested, um, diversity of role, enable people to move freely within your organization. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the mercenary uh, approach. I think while they, while they enjoy constant stimulation, they also really crave some sense of belonging because there is so much uncertainty in their environment. And so creating a way and some frameworks to make people feel like they belong and um, are in a family, depending on the scale of your company, but really creating opportunities for growth. Uh, that's you know, what is driving them, where they can feel that they've got a long 
road ahead of them and they can learn many different skills and attributes. So the rotational programs, all of those I think are very helpful in recruiting them. Can I add on to that? I think, first of all, I, I totally agree. So I also have three kids, 17, 14, and 12. I, I think sometimes I view myself as a millennial also. And also view myself as a generation <laughs> Z as well. So, so meaning, seriously, I don't, don't think you're the CEO, you know, I'm over 48 years old. Always look at it from uh, others' perspective, right? Always talk with them. Assuming you are the millennials, what are you going to be thinking, right? If you don't understand, talk with them. Otherwise, it's really hard to manage those millennials unless you really understand what, what they're thinking and what they're doing every day. I think when I think about, as I talked about observation all the way through execution, I would say uh, the great example last week or a couple weeks ago that I became aware of, which was her motion was observe, execute, then inform. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. So what she did was uh, a manager on our support team uh, went to um, form a relationship with the Year, the year Up program. And two Wait, of, sorry, what the Year Up program up? is an organization focusing on bridging the divide between people who are just not on a path to a professional career. Mm -hmm. In this case, one of our employees eight years ago was picking grapes on a farm in eastern Washington. No one in her family had, graduated, had gone past the 10th grade in high school. So <laughs> miraculously, our support manager said, that's a noble cause. I'm not going to ask Mark for permission, not going to let HR know about it. She went out, she had our recruiting team go to a job fair for year up, and this gal, Alejandra, is now working on her support team studying robotics and AI. Like, who would have thought? Right. Now, had it gone through the standard process of, let me get Jason's approval, let's vet this thing, a lot of people, me included, would have said, well, let's, let's maybe have a plan around it. And she executed, and she informed, and now guess what, we're like tripling down on it. So just a great example of not waiting. Well, so and a great uh, example of thinking out of the box. Totally. I think mm -hmm. as you talk about the war on talent, uh, and if you look at all the research out of Google on, on, on degrees and accreditation, um, you've got to think out of the box. And really, when you talked about what um, the traits were that, you know, hard work, um, you know, leadership, having the tenacity and the grit, um, I, I personally don't rely as much on resumes as I rely on people's story. Mm. Listen to their story, have them walk you through their story. And if they haven't faced adversity, then uh, you should really question whether they're going to be able to stick with you through hard times. Because as you say, we're in an economic boom that has been prolonged, and um, you're gonna want people who've got grit, tenacity, mm -hmm. and commitment um, when things aren't going as well. One thing around Generation Z fitting into workplace is I think there are pros and, I mean, it's easy to stereotype any group, but one thing that I think Generation Z is good at uh, is being working on distributed teams. And I think all of us, like, immediately have to get better at this. I'm dusting off my own skills. I wrote an article on Saster in 2012 saying everyone's going to have to learn how to live with distributed teams, and people flame me. I'm like, well, I had a team in Vietnam and Israel. Mm -hmm. But I think now sometimes, like, our third employee is distributed. That's right. <laughs> and if you don't get good at this today, I don't think you can scale. I don't think you, if our teams build a unicorn, you have, to, you have to learn how to do this early. And one thing I like about Generation Z is that lifestyle they're comfortable with. There are other issues. There's managing it. There's tools. There's collaboration and communication. But they're pretty fluid in working from home to WeWork to the office to London and oh, it's we really, do that, it's right? It's baked in. Uh, I walked into one of my daughter's bedrooms a couple months back and I could hear people talking and I said, who is that? And she said, oh, we're just doing our homework. They were on a house party. And I was like, well, this is, you know, <laughs> I would never have done homework that way. Yeah. yeah? So yeah. I think it's Jason it. right on, actually. I, I never missed any blog from Jason. And uh, 2012, when you talk about a distributed workforce, over the past several years, seriously, I, I, I keep an eye on that. Recently, there are some startup companies. I give you several examples, like Envision or Zapier. Envision, they have over 800 employees worldwide. Guess what? No physical office. Yeah. 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 Everybody working remotely. It works so well. Culture is great. I think you're right on, 2012. Unfortunately, I started a company in 2011. Otherwise, I should not have office. <laughs> it that's was still pizza box team, I know, that's right? a mistake. You should, yeah, you should write it the blog of 2010. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think to, to build on Jason's... But it's hard. It is hard. It's a new hard. set of skills that everyone in this room has got to... If I think of the one set of management skills I have to learn, yeah. we have to learn, it's how to rework ourselves 
to get comfortable with this because yeah. an open door, a physical open door, as bad as it is, it works even less well with right. a distributed team, mm -hmm. right? What did you do to brush up on your distributed team skills? What did you do? Still trying to learn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you have to, for me, it's, uh, it's learn, I mean, I, don't, I, I, I defer to the rest of the panel. For, one is you have to learn how to tolerate more interruptions. Uh, and I need creative time. I need half of my day in order to innovate. I need half of my day for creative time. And uh, you can't work with the distrib distributed team needs more constant interaction than someone that at the end of the day can walk into Eric's office, his lieutenant, his right hand team, at six o'clock, if he's in the office, you can just grab a, grab a, grab a coffee and talk. Right. It doesn't work over the yeah. distributed well, team, think right? Of what, think of the training that these kids have had, right? So they've been on Snapchat constantly getting pinged all the time. They're friends with people on Instagram that they don't even know, but they have like these long track records of following and know exactly where they are at any good. They think completely differently about relationships. Mm. Um, sometimes, you know, not that I, you know, I, I prefer a lot of the, the in-person high touch, but they're completely comfortable with it and used to it. And that's something we have to get comfortable with. Okay, so how is this factoring into your hiring? Scale a company, you need a lot more people. You gotta hire well. How are you winning the war for talent? And how are you attracting this next generation? I think you have to give people latitude. So when we think about physical uh, location, I think distributed teams can manifest themselves like where they work and also distributed decision making inside of an office. So we are in Boston, Bellevue, in Edinburgh, 95% of our employee base is in those three locations. And when someone comes into that office, they don't, they don't want to be encumbered with the check downs, the multiple check downs on every decision. So we're looking for people who are confident. They don't know everything, but they're confident in being able to make that call as opposed to just ideating. Ideating and talking about and pontificating, are you, make the, are you able to make that decision and then let someone know after you've been successful or not? And it's, it's something that I think we assume too much. We assume that people, most people are comfortable with that. They're really, really bright. They're really driven. But if you, if you pause at that point, I think it's hard to distribute uh, decision-making authority. Mm -hmm. Every company I worked with that, that became Teal, do you remember when Teal was in fashion? What was this book? What was, do you know this management book that everyone read? About Teal oh. teams or yeah. red teams? Oh, yeah, yeah. And have, have a distribute responsibility or what everyone owned? Every, every company I work with this teal is now red. They all, they all, they all, they all decided that, that distributed, like, distributed management was hard, right? You, you, need, you need a certain amount of hierarchy to, to make these scaling decisions. Yeah. So I think just to quickly, I think the way I look at this is I think the common mistake is you know, everybody, every company try to you know, focus on the top talents. I think that's wrong. Why do you always want to focus on top talents? So in our case, we would like to hire those people with uh, potential. They may not be top talents today, but yeah. they want to s learn. They, want, they motivate themselves. In five years, they could be top talents. So we never wanted to hire any top talents today. So th with that, we do not compete against with so many other companies. But how do, you, how do you identify that potential? I think part of the reason people go after top talent is you can look at... Great question. So we, we, when we hire the, the people, like Jesse mentioned, we do not look at resume or background. We focus on two things, self-learning, self-motivation, mm -hmm. right? And quite often we interview, hey, which book do you read recently? If you never read a book, you never read Jesse's uh, blog, meaning you do not want to learn something, right? For those people, no matter how good you are and which company you work for, we don't want to hire you. Right, we want to focus on self-learning, self-motivation. Giving them some time. In five years, they will be top talents. Yeah, I think identifying people who have a hunger for self-improvement and continuous learning, uh, and who aren't in, a, we were talking earlier about growth mindset, who aren't in this fixed mindset, who think, okay, well, I went to Harvard undergrad, and I have Stanford GSB on my resume, and I'm, I'm made. Um, and so look for people who've really had to go through adversity and have struggled to um, be here. I mean, immigrants is one, one way of understanding that someone's had a journey um, to, and, and really wants to be somewhere, right? So you have to look at that. I think that mentality when you're hiring, who really wants to be there and why, and how do you feed them and nourish that uh, continuous yearn for learning and improvement? And so giving them opportunities internally to develop them. Um, any best practices, Mark, from your, from your company? 
I think I've really benefited from, from having a chance to work with people who are perceived as, um, as wanting to share. And so the head of sales we got out of NetSuite, um, head, of in, head of product we got out of AWS, these are people who, who are, are good both on paper, but then also the perception of who they are is really strong, and that's, that can serve as an attractor. Now you can't just, you know, have your hat and have no cattle, right? <laughs> so you have to have the goods too. But I think it plays a big role, because perception, you need to have that hook, right? You need to get that person interested in the first place. Um, and I think that's something that we try and solve for. Um, and I think, recognize that people's situations change, right? So as you, what was great five years ago may not be so awesome anymore, and the market changes, and you know, even in a, in a city like ours where Amazon is hiring thousands of people, we have Microsoft, we have two behemoths in our backyard, recognize that things change too. If you've been working at AWS for five years, maybe you're ready for a different, different career spot. I love Eric's point though, like I think having the mindset of not going after free agents, like there's only so much cap room on the roster, right? Yeah. So you can't just load up. And I think investing yeah. in, in youth and letting people demonstrate performance, really good advice. Okay, I wanna ask one lightning round question as we wrap up here. What was one thing that you did or that you saw as a company was scaling that you thought was done too late, or you did too late yourself? Well, let's go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies first. So I, um, NEA, we have four, over 400 portfolio companies, and the one thing I consistently see across our companies, and it's one of the most difficult things for a founder CEO to do, is to recognize when the company is scaling faster than the original founding team. And so, um, you know, there's lots of loyalties, there's deep relationships, um, but waiting too long to um, hire, put the right team in place. And we were talking earlier um, before the panel and you used a sports analogy as loading all the bases. Is that right? Rounding, get it wrong. Round, rounding the bases. bases. I knew I'd get it wrong. <laughs> American sports analogy, but rounding the bases with your executive team and then you have to go around again. You can't sit and think, okay, I've done it. I've got the dream team, right. I'm set. So having that growth mindset about hiring too, because you know, certain people are really excellent at scaling from zero to 100 million, but probably not necessarily the same skill set to do the next uh, 200 million. And so um, I think waiting too long to let go underperformers and to bring in um, the right level person for the job. Mark. One thing you did too late. Uh, hire, built a world-class recruiting team too late. Eric, one thing you did too late. Have a company name. <laughs> 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 Seriously, the two weeks before we launched the product, we still don't have a good name. And I was stuck there. And uh, looking back, it's, it's too late. So. Uh, Jason, one thing you did too late or saw done too late. I think everyone hires their VPs too late their yeah. first VPs, everyone makes the same yeah. mistake. It's, it's better to take a pause, miss a quarter, get behind and just hire the VPs because if you're a CEO and you're the VP, any of the VPs after even a couple million revenue, the company cannot scale. You have to not be the VP. And everyone makes, I made it, we all make it, but if you could just make it less, you will, you will, you will scale better. I'm hearing a theme here. Thank yeah. you so much for being here. Congratulations on beating the odds. Great job, sir. Good luck.